Now, uh, welcome everyone. I'm Bobby Duffy. I'm director of the Policy Institute here at King's. And it is a, a real proper pleasure for me to be hosting uh, this event tonight, chairing the event tonight here at King's, uh, because I've got a long-term interest in generational analysis, and particularly I've uh, I wrote a book which has just been released in paperback called The Generation Divide, which looks across all generations, not just Gen Z. Uh, and the main point is to try to separate stereotypes, myths, and cliches from the reality of generational difference. So, it's a, re a real pleasure, it's going to be a real pleasure um, hearing from true experts on Generation Z, a really wide range of different perspectives today. Uh, but when, before we, I introduce the panel and get uh, Linda to kick us off and then into discussion, it's good always when you're talking about generations to know who's in the room generationally. Um, so I'm going to just run through the generational timeline, the kind of five, five or six key generations we talk about uh, right now to see who we've got. Uh, uh, through a show of hands, so do we have any pre-war generation in the room tonight? Born pre-1945, we do usually sometimes just get one or two. We get less these days, as to be said. Uh, do we have so no pre-war generation, but we do we have baby boomers in the room? 1945, lots of a good smattering of baby boomers. Some, I think, come with their kids. Uh, so people with their hands up, they're the rich ones, baby boomers. <laughs> Uh, it's actually, it's a free bar tonight, but if it wasn't, I'd be saying, go and tap them up for uh, some drinks as the, the, the rich generation. That is a stereotype, that is a generational stereotype, but there is some truth to it. Uh, any Gen X in the room, the best generation? Uh, yes, lots of good Gen X. We're the forgotten middle generation, no one ever talks about us. There's never going to be a Gen X event like this. Uh, and then millennials, poor millennials who do get talked about a lot and picked on a lot. Uh, lots of millennials, that's good. And then most important of all, I guess, tonight, uh, any Gen Z people born 1996 to 2012. Yes, great, a good smattering. Um, we'll be talking mostly about uh, adult Gen Z uh, during this. And you can see there's still a little bit of a, a question mark over when we're going to put the cutoff point. but. People are so obsessed by these generational labels that we're already talking about the next generation. Anyone know what we're calling the next generation? Alpha, alpha that's right. So we're talking about generation alpha from 2013 onwards, people 10 and under. Uh, and we won't be focusing on this because I'm very much in line with uh, this article that talked about it because it includes, you know, toddlers, babies, and the unborn. <laughs> we, we don't have much research on them to, to discuss uh, as yet. So if I was summing up the main theme of my book in one sentence, it's really that um, generational analysis, uh, generational thinking and analysis is an incredibly powerful idea that's been horribly corrupted by terrible stereotypes, myths, and cliches. Because uh, when you look back at the academic thinking on uh, generations and generation change, it brings in some of the biggest thinkers in sociology and philosophy, Auguste Comte actually thought that generational change was maybe the key, key determinant of societal change, the speed of societal change. He said things like, we should not hide the fact that our social progress rests essentially upon death, uh, which I realize is not a very cheery concept uh, for, for this evening. But what he meant was we get kind of stuck in our ways when we get past a certain age. So the successive steps of humanity necessarily require a continuous innovation from one generation um, to the next. So very, very important. So big ideas of life, death, societal progress. So it is a real shame that the type of generational analysis that we get these days is more typically uh, things like this, which is an actual example from last week. The Generation Z are apparently ditching biscuits for samosas with their cuppers, um, which is based on some research, and the research doesn't show that at all, <laughs> by the way, uh, but these are the types of cliches, soft cliches, because these generational labels have become such a, uh, a trope for people, a really handy but not very uh, effective trope. This is actually from the Daily Star, so you may expect that. That's maybe not the highest standards of journalism to uh, aspire to, but uh, you see it all over the place. You may have seen uh, the newsletter this week from The Economist, which had a big feature, set of features on Gen Z. Uh, uh, and some great analysis and data in there, but their, their assessment of it reduces to these types of things. That, uh, uh, how the young spend their money, they are woke, broke, and complicated, which sounds more like astrology than analysis. It's more like horoscopes quite often, these types of generalizations. 
And then on work, which is one of the worst areas of generational research and for generational myths and, and cliches, what Gen Z graduates want from their employers, they want more flexibility, more security, and more money. But then, so do I, I expect uh, all of you do uh, too. So it doesn't really tell you much about the unique features of uh, Generation Z. So in that context, that's why I am so delighted to have such a great uh, panel of contributors for the event tonight. First up, we're going to hear a presentation from Linda Woodhead, who is F.D. Morris Chair in Moral and Social Theology uh, here at uh, King's. Uh, we'll also hear from Laura Jana Klauser, who is Rabbi at the Bromley Reform Synagogue and Inclusion and Development Coach. We will hear from Ruby Granger, who is a high-profile blogger, YouTuber, writer and entrepreneur, a whole collection of different activities. And Kushal Yousafzai, who is a student of religion, philosophy and ethics here at King's as well. So lots of different perspectives and importantly, having Gen Z voice in there uh, too. So hand straight over to Linda. After that, we will have some time for questions, but we'll all be done by 7.45 so you can get uh, drinks or head off. Linda. Thank you very much, Bobby, and thanks everybody for being here. Um, Bobby mentioned his book. Um, Bobby and I first started thinking about this because we've both got books saying somewhat complementary and contradictory things. Uh, Bobby, that generations aren't, isn't a very useful tool, and me writing about a generation with my colleagues, Roberta Katz, Sarah Ogilvy, Jane Shaw. We have very different disciplines, and that was deliberate in looking at this generation. And we wrote this book quite recently, um, and did some research for several years beforehand, Gen Z Explained. And why did we do this? We did it because we've, all of us, except for Roberta, who is uh, an executive in Silicon Valley, and comes from, she was, she was the uh, general counsel for Alta Vista. Anyone old enough to remember Alta Vista? One of those first search engines. Um, but she was um, then working at Stanford University, when, which is where we all met. And we were talking and realized that we were all very interested, we'd all been teaching, apart from Roberta, in universities for a long time. Uh, uh, I'm at the end of the baby room, I put my hand up so you can see how long. And we noticed something different about the generation of students that we were teaching a few years back, you know, different from previous generations. I've never done generational research before, but we did think there's something to be explored here. So let's do some research. We've all got different skills. One's an anthropologist, one was a linguist um, who scraped social media posts, that's Sarah. Um, um, Jane's a historian, so she spends her time saying, no, this isn't new at all. They did this in ancient Greece, or whatever it was we wanted to say was new. And I'm a sociologist, so I did surveys um, and we had a lot of, we had research assistants as well doing interviews with students in the US and the UK, but the surveys were of the whole uh, generation uh, or um, student or not. So that's what this research is based on. Now, it's very easy to say that part of what makes this, what defines this generation is that they are the digital generation that in particular um, they didn't quite grow up with social media and smartphones. I think Facebook started in 2007. Um, but it's been part of um, an important part of their lives for a long time. And it hadn't been for previous generations. Of course that's important. But there are other bigger contexts that are also important. And social media can amplify them. And one of them is... This loss of belief in progress, we found that really quite an important theme for people. So here's a quote um, from our interviews. I know what progress is supposed to look like, and knowing how much progress has been made in history, I feel like I can almost taste it. Yet, it's so, so, so far away, and current events can feel like you're being dragged further and further away from that goal. And there was a widespread sense that progress has stalled, uh, that things won't be as good for this generation as their parents. There's an intense sense of competition. 
But it's partly because more and more people, of course, go to university and are competing for scarce resources. So this sense that there's not this great optimism that things are all going to be fine in my life, that, that's gone for many in this generation. And I said that social media can amplify it. One person talked about accessing uh, the news every 30 seconds when there was some crisis on, you know, an addictive thing of just seeing the bad news over and over. Now, um, this can accentuate a sense of generational difference, whether it's real or not, the perception of it is there. So here's someone saying, my parents see things very differently from our generation. They believe that God gives them what is right and wrong, whereas I just kind of have to find it for myself, whether it's within me in some kind of human nature or social interaction thing, or if it's just truly nothing, and I have to create it from the depths of my own being or something. So as well as a background of, 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 of a lot of uh, hope in, in progress, uh, this pressure on people, even sort of you know, existentially, ontologically. So my summary is that the digital um, uh, is both, it's both crap, there's a lot of awareness of how toxic it can be in this generation. It's also very, very convenient, and there's a lot of appreciation of that. I'm just going to talk about three things that jumped out from our research as very important in understanding this generation. Um, <coughs> identity, values, and I think they're showing us a whole new set of values, and activism. Now, all linked together, as you'll see. Identity is something that you can have some control over. It is for this generation something that you have to discover. It has to be authentic. Um, gender was particularly important, and of course there is a much wider range of options for gender identification than there was for previous generations. That's a very important part of your self-exploration. Also sexuality. To some extent, race and ethnicity, though it's inauthentic, of course, if you're not, you know, if it, it, it's less easy, in a way, to have the choice around that. Um, I mean, if you ask this generation to introduce yourself, like we did at the beginning of interviews, uh, they could say who they are much more clearly and concisely than my generation could. They will give you a quick list of words or images of who they are. In terms of these identities, their values, their idiosyncrasies, they can just reel it off. If you say to my generation, what's your identity? We go, uh, mm, uh, you know, we wouldn't even think often to say, well, I'm a white, middle-class English woman. So it's much more, that, that self-reflexivity is much higher. Ditto with values. So people would often introduce themselves with things that they would, their values are an important part of the identity package, and there's a strong sense of awareness of values. This is very impressive often. Uh, amongst students who can identify very quickly when something's going awry, say on a group chat, and tell you what values are being violated in that and be very articulate about that and what their distinctive values are. And then activism. So let me say a little bit about, more about each one of those and why activism fits in too. Identity, I've said already, has to be discovered. You can't just project it, you know, be creative. It's got to be authentic. And it's not easy to be genuinely honest and um, perceptive about who you are. That might sound very individualistic, but it's something that is also done in interaction with others in a social way. And it's important to share the journey with people who share at least some aspects of your identity. And it leads to a respect for diversity Difference is a very high value, respect for diversity. Your views and values might be very different from mine, but just as I, you owe it to me to respect mine, I should be respecting your right to own those things, as long as they don't cross over into harm. I hope this isn't too small, but when you ask on the surveys, where do you turn when you need help and guidance? The uh, blue is the UK, the orange is the US. The most common answer um, in the UK is own judgment, a little bit lower in the US, but still high, and then feelings and intuition, and they're, they're quite similar. They're both, in other words, turning to your own, to yourself, 
um, to make important decisions. Well, parents, friends, and other things play a role, but you can see they're not, you know, in a sense, it's your responsibility. Um, again, in some ways, it's easier for minority groups to have a sense of sharing the journey with others. So a Native American student in America said, I wear things like this, and he was showing us what his wearing the jewelry. I'm wearing things from my people, and there's a lot of power in things we make by our hands. And even in our designs, they each have, they all have specific meanings. So I like no when I'm wearing them. I have the pride of my people, and I'm representing them here. This sense of representing your community was strong. And values, values, think back to the difficulties of being of this generation. Values provide you with an identity, with a compass, with a means of identifying other like-minded people you might want to associate with. So this person says, I kind of group myself with people who share my same views since we're exposed to the same things, or at least share common interests. So we're really alike in terms of our values. And values were sometimes, quite often invoked in explaining generational differences. Uh, and very often, we respect difference in a way our parents just don't get it, particularly in relation to sexuality and gender. I think there's an emergent ethic here. It's not distinctively created from nothing by this generation, but it's kind of deepened down the generations. It's also to do with how this generation was brought up by their parents. But I've given it three sort of three, um, you know, three tenets to this religion. I'm in theology and religious studies, so I see everything through the lens of religion. So the religion, the true religion, is your own voice if you can find it, and people say live your best life. Your true religion is to, to own one's own life in every sense. So I'll, I'll be me and you do you. And true religion is productive value realizing action in the public world. And a lot of people say, leave the world a better place than you found it. Now that's a different ethic from a Christian ethic focused more around self-sacrifice that my generation was more familiar with, and certainly the ones before that went through the war. And so we have moved in our symbols and our rituals from the cross to the rainbow, which is a celebration of identity and difference. And we have, there are national rituals around this now. And activism, you can see how it flows, because activism is identity-based and values-based. It's the third tenet of my religion, and it has to come from your life and your experience um, to be um, really activist. What are people concerned about activists? Well, you can see here, planet number one, more, more in the UK than the US. And then crime and violence is higher in the US, not surprisingly, than in the UK. So planet inequality, global unrest, crime and violence, economy, social tensions, technology, in that order. Doesn't mean everyone's an activist. We asked, would you identify as an activist? 19% uh, in the UK, 26% in the US. People spoke very highly of activists, but they, you know, it was kind of an aspiration, but I'm not myself, a lot of people would say. And that's my brief overview of some of our main research findings.